What is up? Welcome to episode 44 of the Thursday Night Grind, where every Thursday night I go onto YouTube and I sharpen something on the bench. And this week, you guys have delivered because some time ago I did a video on chainsaw sharpening, and it is one of my most popular videos coming in at like 2,000 views as I'm recording this. Uh, but there's also some things in the comments that give me an opportunity to dive into and discuss that will hopefully further the conversation for everybody else getting into sharpening chainsaws. Before we do that, I do need to mention the Guild of Professional Sharpeners where we are building a community of people who are learning to sharpen and then using that skill to generate money for themselves in the form of a side hustle, a business, a retirement business, uh, a blend of stuff like that. Uh, and the, uh, there's a lot of really cool stuff going on over there. If any of this interests you, make sure you check out guildofsharpeners.org. There will be a link in the description. And just there's a couple of things I do want to share. Uh, first off, the Guild is international. Thanks to some friends from the north. The Canadians are in on this. And uh, I, I, I looked it up and there's like 14,000 cities in the U.S., which... To me, just it was, it's just opportunity, right? Like every town or city has enough um, opportunity for a sharpener. But then you expand that out internationally, and it's just it's just amazing. I, I hope to I hope to change the world, right? So that's exciting to me. The other thing that uh, this this came up this comes up a lot. So one of the major conversations going on is a conversation Jim started about uh, work sharp the blade grinding attachment versus the one by 30, right? Like which one is better? Like what, is, what are the pluses and minuses of each one? And like, that's a discussion, right? And I'm bringing that up because I feel like I haven't handled some questions that I've got lately, right? Like there's two questions that I get a lot. One is, hey, I'm interested in starting a sharpening business. What tool should I buy? Uh, and the other one is, hey, I'm, I'm starting sharpening now. Like how do, I, how do I market? How do I get my first customer? How do I market, right? And I get it, right? Like I get those questions, I really do. And I need to be better at expressing some compassion to that place rather than like, because you don't know, man, like that is a huge question. Like what tools do you get? Like there's so much that goes into that. Like what do you want to sharpen? Like what's your space like? Like how much money do you have to invest? Like what's your skill set at? Like, what that, there's just so much like that's that's a big conversation like I can't answer that in an email and I could get on the phone and go through that and frankly I mean that's what we do in the guild like and that's why I built the guild right so like it's hard for me to like help without like saying like what well, you could join the guild you know and same with marketing man like marketing that's a big animal like how do you I, like it depends there's so many answers ah it's tough, like, and there's so much, and but I just feel like that. That uh, again, to me, it illustrates the value of what I'm trying to build in the guild, and um, I hope that I do better at sharing as much as I can to inspire people to realize how big these questions are and how helpful people can be, not just to tell you what to do but to ask you the questions so that you can decide for yourself smartly. That's the approach I'm taking. Learn more about that at guildofsharpeners.org. Okay, next up I got my notes here because I took some notes from the comments and uh, from, the, from the last video I did. I'll link to it here so you don't have to go hunting for it in the description. But um, Okay, let's just get rolling. Uh, charge more and do your rakers. I think almost everybody, no, that's not true. Like this got several thousand hits. A lot of people wanted to tell me that I need to do the rakers. I know, I know, I do the rakers. I started doing the rakers. What I needed was a way to do them, a way to know what the, and I'm gonna show you tonight how I'm doing them and the little, whatever, $5 tool I'm using to do the rakers correct, and I think correctly, like you tell me, like watch this and let me know if I'm doing the rakers right. Um, yo, the 10 degree tilt, I'll, I'll make a point to show you that on here. The, the, one, one guy, it was T.R. Wilkinson. Th thank you. He, uh, I, I'm, I'm checking this out. The 10 degree tilt. So if you just get a chain in a bag, it, like it's actually really hard to find the numbers for that chain, right? Like the angles and, and like what the rakers are supposed to be and what the tilt, the tilt angle is actually the hard one. So I generally defer to zero if I don't have it. The guy that dropped off here, 
included the boxes, all the numbers are right on the box. Like that's really helpful. Uh, uh, but what this, what the TR mentioned was that full chisel chains generally have a 10 degree tilt, semi chisel chains have zero. So I'm, I'm kind of using that as a rule of thumb and I'm checking the boxes that come in to see whether or not that kind of plays out. So uh, thank you for sharing that. If you have other thoughts on a rule of thumb around if you don't know what tilt shoe you use, I would appreciate you sharing that with us in the comments below. Softening versus hardening, right? So uh, this is, this. even in the comments, this is still a very controversial thing. If you heat up the tooth of a, of a chain, are, are you going to harden the steel or are you going to soften the steel? The, if you harden the steel, then the user, the owner of that chain, will have a hard time touching that saw up with a file in the woods, which might be like their routine maintenance between getting it on a grinder. If you heat it up and it softens the steel, then your cutter is going to dull more quickly when you're using it. So both are bad. What you don't want to do is either, what you really don't want to do is heat up a tooth. Um, so like, I guess the question is like, why? And it was, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't write down your name, but the, you made the, uh, the statement that um, when heating up and quenching is a hardening process, heating up and cooling down like in air is a tempering process. So based on that chain of thought, it, what we're doing is we are softening the steel, we are tempering it, not hardening it. Uh, but if, you know, like, like, the, like the community we live in, someone come in, no, like some steels can air quench too. So the jury, the, the, the jury will always be out. What? That's not totally true because this dude also mentioned what I can do is purposely heat up a tooth and then touch it with the file and see what happens. And I like that. I meant to do it. I, I lost, I had a stump chain, like a chain that I, I'm more comfortable, I'm comfortable with putting in the dirt to get a stump out, but I, I can't seem to find it. So um, I have yet to do that. If you do that, please let me know. Heat a tooth up purposely and then put a file on it. And does the file still remove the steel? Actually do a file first, go heat it up, do a file again, and then you know, based on just, you know, that anecdotal test, like did it, did it file better or worse? Not at all. Like what's the results there? Let me know. Okay. CBN wheel. Yes. I don't have a CBN wheel. It is top of the list. The next time I do a chain sharpening video on the Thursday night grind, it'll be when I have a CBN wheel. I'm that close. I get it. I'm totally on board. I just gotta, I just gotta decide to spend the hundred bucks on it. All right. This, I love this. All right. You suck as much as your grinder. Okay, this is good for two reasons. First off, you won't find it, like I, I'm not leaving that comment up there, uh, but this also came up in the guild too, right? Like anytime you put yourself out there, you need to prepare for negative feedback because what we do, what us humans do, is we're gonna take that very personally. If I, and it happened, right? Like a, some, a customer brought a knife back to me this week and he said, you did this knife recently and it got dull right away. Yeah, I know, okay, like it's, I almost, I, that's actually, I think that's the second time I've gotten net, pers you know, conceivably negative feedback in five years. It, it's still really, e like of the thousands of people that I've helped, uh, it's still really easy to internalize that and, and uh, go be hard on ourselves. So the best way to combat that is one, prepare for it, and then when it happens, you're like, there it is. I knew that was going to happen, right? So it's not really a big deal. Uh, don't take any of that personally. And the other thing is surround yourself with people who support you. And that's, that's another big thing that I love about the guild is I'm not just selling a course on like, here, buy this course and do this. No, like the course is part of the community. Like go learn from the course. And then as you're implementing it, bounce those ideas off the community. If someone comes at you with bad, with negative feedback, be like, yo, bad day, man. Like this customer's, you know, not happy. And like, it's not you, man. Like it had, it, it had to happen sometime, right? So what can we learn from that? How can we move forward? How did you handle it in the moment? How can we, how, like, here's how I handled it. What do you think about that? So, um, okay. And the, so that's point number one on that, that comment. You suck as much as your grinder. The second comment is, what's all the beef with the super jolly? Like, 
I, I get a lot, I feel like there's been some, like people who don't like the super jolly. I don't have a huge problem with it, but I do want to thank Dennis Kuhn. He actually did Roger up and like, um, I was like, okay, like, could you tell me why, why people don't like this grinder? Like, why is there that negative feedback out there? Uh, and the, the two things he came up with, I agree. And one is that the way the grinder works, you're going to grind outside in on the tooth on one side and inside out on the other. And I like the outside in. The problem I don't like with the inside out is it throws a little burr around the outside. It's not a big deal. Dennis hits it with a file after, you know, my opinion is as soon as you touch a piece of wood with it, it's going to pull that burr off if I don't get it off before. So I agree, but like, show me a grinder that doesn't do that. Like, where's the, if this is so bad, what's the better one, right? Like, keep asking that. Like, what's so bad about it? What's the better one? Like the Franzen, you can go look that up. If you want to drop 20 or 30 grand on a chainsaw sharpener, like get the Franzen. And as I'm thinking about it, I'm not sure that the Franzen even does that right. So I don't know. Dennis did mention the, the steel. I didn't write it down. You, you, something. One of you guys can help me out. Another a, a steel version of this style grinder still does the same thing. I, I don't know. So, uh, okay, the other one, the other one is that it's not square, right? So when you, when you grind one side and then you move it the, to grind the other side, the tooth length isn't exactly the same. And you can't adjust for that. Uh, honestly, I haven't seen that to be a huge issue. If the tooth is a little bit different, I, I, I mean, I'd have to put calipers on it to tell you how different it is. So I don't, I'm not, I'm not upset with the Super Jolly. I think I, I paid for it and chain and I'm still cutting chain with it and I'm not, I don't know, I don't have a big beef about it, but it seems a lot of people want to tell me that this grinder sucks. So uh, I'd love to learn more. Let me know. Okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm, going to, uh, I'm just going to record some video of uh, sharpening some chains, show you some things that might be different from the other one, and uh, I'll voice over from here on out. The big advancement in my shop over the last week has been the installation of my centralized dust collection system, which you just saw me turn on check for suction there. Every now and then I like to dress the wheel, which I'm doing with that dressing tool, and then just checking it with that tool, which looks like that. So that jig came with the Super Jolly. Okay, happy Halloween, everyone. The uh, Before we do the rakers, I just wanted to show you this pitch and gauge tool. And this is good. I use this for a few things. First off is the, the bar groove gauge. The little, all those are sized appropriately so that I know how to set the bar groove fitting, uh, setting on the grinder. The other thing that it has is the depth gauge. This side is 0.025 or 25 thousandths. On the other side, it is 30 thousandths. So when you see me doing that, uh, you'll, uh, you'll understand what I'm doing. I'm going to set this. That's uh, 30 thousandths below this. Okay, let's go do it. It's got a bunch of other stuff on here too that matters less to me. But um, if you want to call anything else out on this that has been helpful for you, let me know. Using that pitching gauge tool to check the bar groove gauge, so that, uh, and I didn't adjust it there, but that dial right in front adjusts the bar groove gauge on the Super Jolly so that when that hydraulic clamp clamps the chain, it clamps it at the right tension and uh, holds the tooth during grinding. Now we just get into that same old routine where we, um, I, heard, I also didn't show you setting the angle, which I did check. It was already set up for 30 degrees on this chain. And I'm just uh, setting the, going through the teeth now, you've seen me maybe touch that dial a few times to set the amount of tooth that I'm cutting off. We'll get nice and close in on it here. A little bump, bump, tap, tap, and then finish the cut. 
One thing I noticed on this set of teeth was that the right hand cutters were significantly more worn than the left hand cutters. I've seen stuff like that before, but not to the extent that I've seen on this one. It seemed kind of, kind of relatively extreme. Just getting you a few different angles on the cutting process here. The bump, bump, tap, tap. Finish the cut. On these chains, a lot did need to be removed, so I had to go around a few times, especially because on the right-hand cutters, I had to go back quite a bit and then therefore even the cutters out on the left-hand side. Well, we got a minute. I also want to let you know that before I started sharpening these, I uh, did also include a parts washer in my system. So I had these soaking out in the parts washer, I think overnight actually, and then I wash them off. I dry them off with compressed air, and then I bring them into the shop. I like that system. Uh, the, uh, the parts washing fluid that I'm using does seem to leak, when it dries, it leaves a little film. When I do spray them off, uh, it seems to mitigate the problem, but I still do see it. But it, um, the little um, film might not even be the right word, a little bit of miscoloration, just something left on the chain, but it is not dirt, grime, grease, and bar oil, and sap, and everything. So it's a, uh, and it doesn't burn off and create as much smoke as a dirty chain does in the shop either. So. I'm still a fan of it, although I will say that I maybe have not perfected the, the chain cleaning process. I think what you might have seen uh, happen while I was running my gums was we are now working on uh, the other set of cutters. So now we're over on the right hand side. I spun that little vise around to 30 degrees the other way. I did neglect to show you the, the zero degree tilt like I said I would, but it is. Um, in this case, uh, the rule of thumb did apply, and these are semi-chisel chains in the box and uh, instructed us to do uh, no tilt angle. So I'm gonna keep my eye out for that one. Conveniently, these four chains are all off the same saw, so I don't really have to check everything. I can go from uh, one chain up to the next. I do need to make sure that I set my uh, cutter depth of cut appropriately with each new chain that comes on. Here I am searching for that. The I like using, sometimes these chains are have two cutters on the same side in a row where the chain uh, has been linked. And I like to use that point as the start point so that I know when I get back to where I started. That's what I was just looking for there. Sometimes it takes longer than other times. Sometimes they are also joined with a colored link, which makes it a little easier to see. And now I'm just uh, doing my routine, just going through it. Tap, tap, bump, bump, slide it away. Speed it up here, and I'll just share that I have been doing some cutting lately, and I am, I'm definitely in the camp of a full chisel chain. The, uh, what I've heard is that they have a tendency to wear faster, but they do cut nice, and when you're set up to manage your sharpness of chain, that full chisel is nice. I also started using a stump vise, which is awesome, and I touch the tooth with a file every time I put gas in the saw. Just finished this chain, so now I'm gonna set the grinder up for doing the rakers, come up to 90. Swatch, switch wheels. This is the five and three quarter by five sixteenths by seven eighths wheel, flat. Go to zero, back the chain out so that we are Touching down on the rakers. Set 
set the depth. First, let's use the pitching gauge tool to see where we're at. Yep, this one needs to come down. Setting up on one tooth here, one tooth here, checking the depth gauge. If I'm hitting, I gotta take some off. Gotta take a little bit off, just gotta bump it. So you'll see me bump it a few times, then come back and check. Once I adjust the stop to get to the right point, and call that good. So here you soon see me uh, set the depth and then fine tune. This is a nice way to turn it back another. There we go. Back another, you know, fraction of a turn. Bump, bump, bump. Let's check it. 25 or 30,000. So here's the here's still my common sense like thoughts around the, the rakers, right? Like I feel like some people in the previous video I did got a little excited about the rakers. Like and I'm not saying you don't need to do the rakers. I'm saying that like, I don't know. Are you going to know if I if I set them to 25 or if I set them to 30,000? So then if I'm just taking off a little bit of tooth, are you going to know that it's 5,000 off like so one, one other guy, I think it was Dennis again, commented like, yeah, like, you know, every few times you put the chain on the grinder, you should, you should check the rakers. And like when I'm doing my own saw, like when I prod it in and I'm going to go back out tomorrow, like I might not check the rakers. But then if, um, you know, every few times, whenever I think of it, like I'm going to check the rakers and if they're high, I'll bring them down. And just to understand the purpose of these, they, 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 they set the amount that the tooth bites in the wood. So if your rakers are too high, then your tooth uh, will pass right over the wood. And if they're too low, then your tooth will bite too much and you'll bog your saw down. So they matter, like don't misunderstand me there. Um, and then the other thing to note that is since I'm doing saws for customers, I don't know any of the history on this chain. So I, I do have to check the cutter, the, the rakers with every chain that comes through. I have. I will say the majority of the time, the rakers do need to be touched, brought down just a little bit. And there are occasions where the rakers don't, like their, their depth is good. So here we'll just settle into the routine. This one goes, you know, it's a little, there we go. Look at that. We made it all the way around. Set that aside, bring the next one in. And then we remember for just the tooth, the cutter here is going to be a little bit different. So we do need to reset the depth of cut on the rakers for every chain that we do. It would be easy to kind of get lost and just keep chugging away, but that would be incorrect. So here we set the depth. I think that one needed just a little bit more. Saw that hydraulic clamp on the, uh, sometimes when you're doing this, I have to manually push the grinder up a little bit. That depth of cut looked good. Now we just start marching through. If you made it this far, thank you so much for watching episode 44 of the Thursday Night Grind. Please remember to do all the cool things that cost you nothing and help me out, like hitting the thumbs up, subscribing to my channel, leave a comment down there. That would really help that out. Uh, this chainsaw sharpening thing is a dynamic place, so please, like, if I've said or shown anything that you think could be improved, I would like to know. Um, just let me know in the comments. We'll continue the conversation, and I will see you next week. Thank you so much.